All right, welcome to tonight's virtual event featuring the Hess Collection. My name is Shannon and I am a part of the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlet social team. We have a super special event for you tonight as part of our 90 Days Around the World promotion. Uh, so far we visited and met with so many uh, wonderful people, um, been to so many different places and tonight we're actually traveling to Napa Valley, California. It's not quite as warm as we all would have liked, but nonetheless, it's a little bit warmer than here in New England. So I am joined by a few experts tonight. We have Dave Guffey. He is the chief winemaker with the Hess Collection Wine Estates. We also have Christina, I don't, I'm probably going to say this wrong. I hope it's Teresa. <laughs> um, and she is the marketing and creative services manager for the Hess Collection. Of course, we have our buddy Chad Gibson of the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets Wines Marketing Team. So Dave and Christina have a super uh, exciting presentation to share with us tonight. I'm of course here to share any questions that you have for them. Uh, so please make sure to leave those in the comments section. Chad's here to answer any questions uh, you may have regarding inventory or availability. Um, and he also happens to be an expert in wine as well. So any wine questions he can probably help with on those as well. So for those of you that have pre-registered tonight, we're gonna to be giving away two $25 New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlet gift cards, as well as a Hess swag bag with goodies directly from their winery. So we're gonna be asking three tri trivia questions for those. So make sure you're listening super closely to tonight's presentation. And of course, we'll announce the winners and contact everyone via email uh, over the next day or so. So with that, I will pass it off to you, Dave and Christina. What can you tell us about the Hess Collection Wines? Thank you, Shannon, for the intro. So I think uh, first and foremost, we always like to tell everyone that our favorite game to play is what, Dave? Stump the oh. winemaker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, embarrass the winemaker. Embarrass the winemaker, stump the winemaker. <laughs> Send us your questions and, and you can they can be anything you want. Uh, we love that. We like to be in, as interactive as possible with you, but we're really excited to be here. And um, yes, so we were just now complaining about the weather being in the 50s and how cold it is, but uh, we, won't, we won't complain about that anymore. So Dave, um, let's start off with a little history about the Hess Collection. I think first I want to um, run down the wines that we're featuring today. So we've got two of our Hess Collection Alomi wines. So the Pinot Noir from Carneros and then the Napa Valley Cabernet from the Alomi Vineyard. And then after that, we're gonna transition over to our Lion's Head Collection wines. Lion's Head Collection is a brand new portfolio for us uh, with some fun and exciting wines. So we've got our Lion Tamer Red Blend and then our Lion Tamer Cabernet. So Dave, you wanna kick us off, introduce yourself um, tell us, tell us about yourself and about a little history on Hess. All right. Well, um, thank you everyone for joining us. I wish I could be out there um, pouring my wines at the table like the good old days, but I guess it's going to have to wait maybe another year. Um, my name's Dave Guffey. I've been the chief winemaker out here uh, for the Hess family for the last 22 years. Um, but the winery, of course, started a lot longer uh, before I got here. The, the winery actually was started back in the 70s, about late 70s, around 78 or so. And uh, Donald's story is a pretty classic story in terms of how you get involved in the wine business. You know, uh, Donald uh, had no idea he was going to get in the business when he came to America um, looking for a, a business opportunity. Donald got himself invested in mineral water in Switzerland, and he had a uh, mineral water company up in the Alps of Switzerland in a small town called Vols. And so he called the water Valser water. And uh, this was, you know, sometime in the early 60s, um, but he felt like one day mineral water and bottle might, might be big. Um, turns out he was right. So he came to America looking at different water opportunities. And, um, you know, he started on the East Coast and he looked at a, a couple of water opportunities back there and he gradually made his way out to the West Coast and he looked at a water company that's still in the Valley uh, today 
Um, the deal didn't work for him, um, but he decided since he was in Napa Valley, he'd heard something about these wines. This was around, you know, call it 1975 or six. Um, and so he tried, he, uh, he went to the local restaurant, you know, he tried, um, he said, bring me your best Chardonnay and your best ca Cabernet from the region. Um, he tasted those wines and fell in love. So, um, you know, what do you do if you want to get more involved and more knowledge in the wine business? Well, Donald, you know, staying in, I don't know where he was staying. There was really nothing in Napa back in those days. Um, I'm pretty sure they were motels, not hotels. And so Donald jumped on the, the yellow pages. I guess they'd be the white pages, right, out of the, uh, the bedside table. And he looked up some guy named Robert Mandavi because he heard he was kind of an up and comer. Um, and so he called up um, Bob, uh, guess where, at his house, because that's the one that was listed. And uh, back in those days, if you all can remember, you know, we didn't have uh, cell phones, we didn't have answering machines. Um, and so when your phone rang at home, you pretty much answered it. <laughs> and so uh, Robert picked up the phone and he said, listen, you don't know me. Uh, uh, my name is Donald Hess and I'm from Switzerland. I can't do the accent, sorry. Um, yeah. And uh, Robert said, sure, I'd love to, love to see you, um, love to talk about the wine business. And so he, uh, he made an appointment, went to his office. And what resulted from there was two things. Uh, first of all, a lifelong friendship. But um, secondly, and the thing I find really funny is uh, Robert said, um, listen, Napa Valley is a real up and coming place for Cabernet. It's a great place to grow Cabernet. But if there's one thing that you should do, is you need to stay down here on the valley floor. The soils are beautiful. It's easy to farm. It's flat. It's uh, great, great weather. There's always many. There's already many uh, prominent Cabernet vineyards coming out. Don't go to the mountains. It's nothing but trouble up there. And so, you know, what did Donald do? He came up here on Mount Veter. He found a vineyard that was um, uh, had been planted, uh, but was in a little bit of uh, need of replanting. Um, Part of the vineyard was also an old cherry orchard and so he renovated that vineyard and got himself started right around 1978. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that I've been traipsing in these mountains for the last 22 years is, uh, is simple. I mean look at the shot there. Um, it's beautiful up here. Um, it's challenging up here um, but when you get it right the wines that you can make from these mountain slopes are unparalleled and so that's kept my attention. Um, and challenged me over the all these years and uh it's been great to work with the uh, the vineyards and it's also been great to work for a family run place um who's invested into the family uh we went from owning one vineyard back in 78 to now we have six different vineyards um, all around napa valley three of them up here on mount veter and another three uh located down on the valley floor and so uh, it's been great, you know, to be involved in the grape growing part of it, as well as the winemaking in a place that's truly interested in um, quality and truly interested in long-term vision. And so I guess that's not a short version, but there you go. That's my version of how we got here. Dave, since you mentioned the different vineyards and we're about to taste to these, uh, the two Alomi wines, they come from very different ends of the valley. Um, I have a map here. Let's just point out just to kind of orientate everyone uh, where you're talking about Mount Veter is and then in relation to the Alomi vineyard and then um, where you also get the grapes for the Pinot Noir. Yeah, so um, so Mount Veter um, is one of five mountain appellations in Napa. Um, you know, mountain fruit from all districts have slightly different characteristics, but in my estimation, all um, really great cabs if you like to lay something down and age it. Mount Veter is the southernmost and the coolest um, mountain district, and it actually separates the city of Napa to the city of Sonoma. Um, you, you'll see, well, I guess you can see where, oh, Christina, mm -hmm. look at you. You've got the elevations right there. Um, yeah, it ranges from around 900 feet, uh, which is where the winery is on up to about 2000 feet, which is just short of the peak of Veter. Um, the beauty of Veter, and we'll see some probably more vineyard shots in a little bit is from our Veter Summit Vineyard, you can literally see the skyline of San Francisco and you can see the, the two towers of the Golden Gate Bridge. So it's quite stunning, but fairly Southern and fairly cool. Now, if uh, I'm gonna start off with the Alomi Pinot Noir, the Pinot Noir is grown um, 
in the Carneros area. Um, and the Carneros is actually pretty much on the base of Mount Beter. You know, there's a little separation, but you're talking about a couple of miles. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we're tasting it. I hope you have some to taste with me. If you don't, taste whatever you have and we'll pretend it's Reno. Um, and then uh, once you leave Mount Vitor, you can look all the way up on the furthest, uh, you know, uh, up the valley and sort of to the right is Alomi and Iron Corral vineyards. And those are in the furthest northeastern corner of Napa. Um, there's sort of a saying out here, like for every mile you drive north, it gets a degree warmer. And that's because you're getting away from the San Francisco Bay. Um, and that's true. So Alomi is going to be nice and warm. And you're going to see that in the Alomi wine and the Lion Tamer wine, which is largely sourced uh, up between those two vineyards. You're going to see that nice ripeness and richness in that cab. Well, on that note, we should probably taste them, right? I'm ready. Okay. Well, I just have one question for you before we dive in, just to kind of give a little bit of perspective, because this map doesn't show all the details. So if, if you were to drive, Dave, you know, from Mount Veter, which is where the winery is located, up to the, up all the way north to the Alomi Vineyard, about how long does that take you? So that, that'll take you, um, without traffic, that'll take you a good hour, hour and 10. Okay. Yeah. And you're going up over two ranges, right? You're leaving Mount Veter. You're driving up Valley and you're going over the Baca Range and over Howl Mountain uh, to get there. All right. So two very extreme edges of the Napa Valley. Yep. Yep. Okay. Alomi yeah. Pinot Noir. Let's taste it. <laughs> so what can you tell us about this wine? Wine making well, I mean style. First of all, I think that, you know, all of us that have been in the wine business for a while, um, I think have a really deep um, love for Pinot Noir. I mean, Pinot is such a versatile um, wine. It can be many different wines, can it? You really have to know the producer as to understand what kind of style that you're getting into. Um, before I came to Hess, I was in Santa Barbara County making you know, noir. So um, it, it was really great for me to be able to go back to those roots and dust off my uh, my old notes and, and get back into it. Um, this Alomi Pinot Noir, uh, we were really, really lucky because I could, <clears throat> like I mentioned, it's in the Carneros uh, district and it's from a really old and recognized vineyard known as uh, Winery Lake Vineyard. Uh, for all you Pinot heads out there, I, I know that you, you've seen this before. I mean, I think um, CD used to do a winery lake has been your designate and I'm going to, I'm going to pace you. I'm going to take you back to like the eighties and the nineties. Um, I think Sterling has done winery lake on a vineyard designate. Um, there's been a couple and the vineyard is, um, is really interesting because, uh, when you look at this wine, it's Pinot Noir, right? And it's got really, really great color. I don't know why it's like that. <laughs> I mean, it's just the site. I can literally go a stone's throw up the road to a neighbor's property and find a, a whole different quality and a whole different color scheme. So this is 100% Pinot Noir. Um, I'm using three different clones out there, 828, 115, and 667. Um, and it throws a really, really nice color. And associated with the color, you're also going to get a, a really deep berry uh, kind of concentrated fruit. So this is not a Pinot Noir that's going to be super light. Um, it tends to not have so much of the forest floor as other Pinot Noirs can have, but I really appreciate it because it's bold um, and it's really rich. And when we match it up with a, uh, a little bit of French oak, we put about a third new French oak every year um, and age it for about 18 months. This is a wine that um, uh, it tastes great, first of all. You know, it's like if you've never had a friend who's had Pinot Noir before, this is a great wine for them to start off their Pinot Noir journey with. Um, it's got all the right, uh, it, it hits on all cylinders, right? It's got the fruit, it's got richness. Um, there's nothing too funky or weird in this one. Um, it's very, very straightforward. So um, yeah, this wine is aged about 18 months, but it's also a Pinot that you can lay down and it'll reward you for aging. And uh, this, I don't know what vintage you guys have. I actually have the 19, which we bottled um, last August. 
but we only started this um, in 2018. And I guess you can see the scores right there. So the 18 was the first vintage and, uh, and there you go. Now we're into the 19, but um, I love Pinot Noir. I love this wine. We are on the 2019 here in New Hampshire. It's in the rollout program. So thoughts, questions? Do we have any tough questions for Dave yet? Let's see. So we did have a lot of comments about how beautiful the view was at the vineyards themselves, um, which I can also agree with. Uh, so actually, Wendy Wilton on our Zoom chat is actually curious how long you can age it in the bottle. Okay, Wendy, that's a great question. Um, it's always a little bit tricky because it's a new program for us, right? So I can't rely on, on my own experience, but I know the vineyard quite well. Um, and with this style, assuming that you want the wine to more or less taste the way that it does right now, I would say that that character will hold for the next seven, eight, nine years. And then what it's going to do after that is it's going to shift into the secondary aromas, right? Um, you're going to get um, probably a little bit of color loss and you're going to get a little bit more um, probably in that forest floor uh, type of character. But um, it, it's going to hold on for, you know, in that in that realm for probably another 15 years. Easy. I get a lot of nice winter spice in this. It's kind of like, to me, this is the style of Pinot Noir I want to be drinking right now. This cool weather. And then with some of the foods that we're also eating right now, which too, I think this Pinot Noir is one of the most versatile wines when it comes to food pairings. Would you guys agree? Beautiful wine. Well, um, let's now talk about Alomi Cabernet. So this is a wine that, uh, how long have we been making this wine, Dave? How many vintages do you think? Uh, well, uh, let's see. I got here in the spring of 99 and uh, we were just harvesting our first crop in 99. So this uh, just started, uh, the vineyard started to produce in 99. We didn't actually come out with this label until somewhere around 2003 or four. Yeah. This, uh, this vineyard has uh, got kind of a funny story to it because uh, uh, I'm trying to do two things at once, very hard for me. Um, this, you know, we worked with it from 99 up to like 2003 or four when we decided to go with the Lomi. And to be honest with you, it was a, a bit of a bugger to um, get it off the ground. Um, this vineyard was it grew the most, the smallest berries I've ever seen on Cabernet, which is great, you know, from a concentration standpoint, but really crappy when it comes to like actually getting a yield that will pay for the farming. <laughs> so we had a heck of a time um, figuring out uh, in a pretty um, extreme element area, um, I'm talking about really cold in the winter and really warm in the summer, how to, how to, pull just a little bit extra out so we could get maybe three tons to the acre and have this be a sustainable vineyard. Um, once we did that, and it took, um, it took a lot of experimentations and a lot of risk, um, then we never looked back, you know, then, then it became a loamy. We, we started to bottle up as a single vineyard um, originally, and now have just changed it into sort of a loamy as a, uh, as a brand name for the wine. Um, but this wine is, I mean, this vineyard, there it is. It's just about 150 acres of Cabernet. Um, and we're really, really lucky to have a great water source. Um, the reservoir is good. You can't quite go water skiing on there, but um, well, maybe you could if you're better than I am, but it's, it's a nice size reservoir. Um, and we've got a great water supply behind that, which is really, really needed. Um, you can see the, the vineyard is rolling hills. It, it's, uh, it come, backs up to a little bit of uh, you know, rolling oak tree uh, hills and uh, the mountain. wines that come off this vineyard are just really ripe and round and rich. Mm -hmm. I think it really makes a style of Cabernet that's really in vogue right now. So this is the Alomi Vineyard and it kind of helps put into perspective. We were looking at the map that was flat, but this vineyard just sits right at the foothills of Howl Mountain on the eastern side. So you can see that there in this footage. Um, and Dave, you also talked about temperature swings and extreme weather. Uh, Laurel has a question. 
since you mentioned that, what does extreme temperature uh, swings do to the grapes? And um, do you do anything to mitigate these temperature swings? Like, how do you control that? Yeah, we do. Um, so it's like compared to our Mount Veeder experience in farming, it's a, it's a different uh, strategy up there because uh, during the winter, of course, what it means is uh, we're going to stay dormant. It actually will bud out later than um, Mount Veeder will and some parts of the Napa Valley. Um, but then during the summertime, because it's up and over Hall Mountain, it's a little bit landlocked. You're talking about as far north as almost um, Calistoga. So you're going to get pretty warm. You know, if it's 80 degrees on, on Veeder, it could be 100, 105 degrees up there um, during the summertime. So we'll leave a few more leaves that um, surround the clusters. Uh, we learned that one the hard way. <laughs> uh, got pretty warm one year where we literally made grape nuts on one side of the vine. Um, and when it gets really extreme, like there's been a few times it's gotten up to 110, 112, um, we'll actually use the overhead frost protection system as a heat cooling system. Um, and that'll drop the, the temperature around the fruit about 10 degrees just by evaporation. So that comes back into having a nice water supply. So that's, that's kind of how um, we have to guard against some of those extremes. But again, what it does to the fruit, uh, it really makes fruit intense Cabernet and it softens those tannins down. So when we pick it, um, it makes a beautiful fruit forward soft style of cab that I think um, many of us enjoy these days. And it'll be nice to compare this too with the Lion Team or Cabernet because uh, stylistically they're very different. I think let's talk about some of those differences between, be, besides just the, the site itself. Um, from a winemaking perspective, I know that with Alomi, you definitely um, have an affinity for the American oak with this wine. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so when we um, when we solved the vineyard problem uh, back in 03, we, uh, and we knew we wanted to do vineyard designate um, the next task was to kind of figure out if there was a better uh, oak marriage between the, versus just French with this vineyard or, you know, what we should do. So we, we do what you always do. You know, we trialed a lot of different uh, toast levels in French. We, we trialed um, Hungarian oak, Eastern European oak. We trialed American oak um, and from many different producers. And we found one producer here right in the Napa Valley that um, uses uh, American oak that comes from Missouri um, that just matched the flavor and that ripe fruit profile perfectly. And so we made that switch back in uh, 05, I believe, and never looked back. Um, Iron Corral is a different source and that source is a little uh, bigger and richer and the traditional um, fine tannins you get from French oak seem, tend to match up a little bit better. And we'll discover that as we, as we taste here in just a minute. definitely get some red fruit on that. Um, it's more of a red fruit profile, I would say, than some of our other Cabernets, especially when you're looking at Mount Beater. Um, current, a little bit of like plum too, because of that, the nice acidity. And we always say that this is kind of our, our crowd pleaser. This is the wine that I bring to any sort of dinner party, which I don't really remember what those are like anymore, but um, you know, it's, it's one of those, it's a Cabernet that is super approachable. Uh, you don't necessarily need to decant it for, you know, an hour and a half before you enjoy it. Um, just because of the, the tannins are much more approachable, like you were saying. And it's all yes. due to, I get the Alomi Vineyard in the location really, right? It is. Yeah. You know, and I guess one other, um, in, in part of Alomi's history, and for, for me, what it illustrates is the reason why I've hung out here for a big chunk of my career is, um, you know, you plant a vineyard, it's not cheap. Um, and, you know, when we planted this vineyard, there was not vineyard there before. So there wasn't a lot to go, oh, we'll just do this and we'll do that because that's what worked. So we, we put a couple different varieties down. We put, you know, it was largely Cabernet, but we had some other varietals in there. And, you know, I give us like a B plus on the scorecard. I mean, most of the blocks were fine, but there was a couple blocks that we tried, uh, you know, some tricks. We tried some, well, what you normally do to adjust things when things aren't coming in exactly the way you, you wanted to. But there was a couple blocks that needed just to change varieties. Mm -hmm. And um, I can tell you this, you know, going into your ownership and asking for more money after they've outlaid a ton of cash 
is generally, um, you can imagine the answer that you're going to get, but um, the Hess family is willing to reinvest. So with uh, some blocks uh, after four or five or six years, um, we either grafted or removed and replanted. Um, and when we did that, um, the vineyard became, you know, three fourths Cabernet, um, about another 40% or, or uh, I guess it'd be 20% came into Petit Syrah and a touch of Petit Verdot. And when we did that, this, this bottle of wine, um, every block out there now was hitting on all cylinders um, and it made it super consistent. So from a winemaking perspective, it's great. You know, we still blend, we still mess around with the oak. Um, if some, you know, if there was a lot that just didn't come up to par, it, it wouldn't go in the blend, but largely the entire vineyard is now in this bottle. And from your um, aspect, what you should appreciate about that is the consistency. Um, the consistency from the vineyard, but um, sometimes vineyards could have big swings. And in this one, it's, it's a nice, consistent source. And uh, if you don't believe me, just try a few minutes of this and tell me what you think. Okay, Dave, we've got some questions rolling in for you, okay? So first off, uh, let's talk about the oak. Um, Paul is asking, what, what does it mean exactly when you say 27% new American oak? Okay, so, uh, so you've got a lot of wine, let's call it a lot of thousand gallons. Um, when you put that down, there's a couple, you know, you can do it a lot of different ways. But what I like to do is I like to create, um, I like to create wines that are balanced from the beginning, right? So I wouldn't want to make one lot super over extracted and another lot very light like rosé to blend them together to come to the middle. You know, I want to make wines that are balanced right off the bat. Um, and so that includes the oak profile. So if you apply that kind of thinking towards oak, you could put um, this one lot all in new oak and have it be your big oak uh, contributor to the blend. But I would prefer to, to, to vary it up. So in my thousand gallons, I'm going to put 27% of that into, uh, into new American oak. And then I'm going to stagger the other barrels um, in so many one-year-old, so many two-year-old, and so many three-year-old and older barrels, so that if I put all that one lot back in the tank, it it has a balanced taste. It's not overly oaky or underly oaky. So that's mm -hmm. that's the twenty-seven percent right there. Okay. Um, the, the only other, other thing. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, the, uh, well, the other question is uh, related to aeration, um, and Colin did respond to this in the chat but if you want to just talk about your philosophies on aerating wine or opening up and decanting dave uh, what do you like to do you know it's funny because i think we all we all only think about decanting when you have a really old wine or there's a bunch of sediment in the bottom of a bottle assuming you saw that before you started pouring um uh you know decanting is great uh but i will admit i don't do it near enough um, obviously decanting is for, I mean, I think the first and foremost, uh, job of decanting is to get a wine off sediment so that when you're at the table and you get that last little bit and you pour it in your glass and it's a bunch of, yeah, you know, um, you don't wind up drinking that. So, uh, but decanting old wines can be tricky, can't they? I mean, how many, I'm, I'm sure all, a lot of us have had that really old bottle of wine, somebody brought to Christmas and you know, you decant it because you think that's the right way to go. Nine times out of 10, it, it probably is. And the wine tastes beautiful until about 30 or 40 minutes into it. And then the wine falls flat on its face. So um, uh, I think that um, in that instance, what you need to do with an older wine, I would still say yes, decant, but, but be prepared for that. You're not every wine, but you're probably not gonna wanna let that wine hang out forever. It's been cramped in that bottle for 20 years. Enjoy it, but you know, leave a little bit for the experimentation and enjoy it while you still like the taste. On the younger wines, I would tell you even wines, even these wines, um, uh, if I had a decanter or even better, one of those um, Venturi aerators, because those things, I mean, that's like a decanter on steroids. I mean, that thing puts way more air in than decanting unless you flip it in your blender and turn on the on switch, you know, it's, those things are great and they'll make, you know, even a young wine like this uh, stand up and sing. Um, and so I guess that's my soapbox is I don't do that near enough. I've got one on my, you know, back bar and it stays there on the shelf for some reason. So I need to bust that thing out more and use it. 
Okay, Dave, one last question and then we'll move on to our Lion Tamer wines. Um, Lisa would like to know how many pounds of grapes do you process at a time? Well, we, we quantify the pounds into tons. And so a ton of grapes is 2000 pounds. And from a ton of grapes, you're gonna get about 60 cases of wine. So um, who asked this question? Um, this was, oh, I lost it. Oh, okay. uh, Lisa. Lisa, okay, Lisa. So, um, so to answer your question, um, it, I mean, it could be many different units, right? I mean, literally from uh, a half of a ton is probably about the smallest that we would work with because in a half a ton, you're probably gonna get, uh, well, 30 cases, 25 cases and like one barrel of wine. Um, so we, we, but we do that small here and then we'll also do up to a truckload. So a truck um, just to stay legal on the road can haul about 24 tons, most trucks. So we can do, we can do uh, up to that amount and all sorts in between. And uh, yeah, so I guess to answer your question, like for Cabernet, most of our most of our lots come in three, five, eight tons, that type of thing. And that's how we patchwork it all together. All right, well, let's go and move over to the Lion's Head collection. Um, and we did just have a question come up or really a comment about the crushed tank that's right behind you. And this is a perfect segue into talking about Lion's Head because Dave's actually sitting in the Lion's Head cellar, um, which was built, uh, we finally opened it in, it was 2018, right? When, when it was finally complete? Yeah. Uh, the yeah. earthquake happened in 2014. And so this has been a project. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about the history of this collection, the cellar, how these wines came to be before we dive right into the tasting. Yeah, no, no problem. I mean, I'm glad you noticed. Yeah, I'm here. I, we can't believe the lights stayed on. I'm so lucky that maybe there's something happening down there. I don't know. They're all on motion sensors, you know, because uh, we're conserving energy. Um, but here's uh, that just so you have a better view of what's yeah, right behind you. Dave. Um, so, so this is, yeah, this is our new Lion's Head collection, uh, cellar. Um, for me, this is, uh, you know, there's always good things that could come out of any tragedy. I mean, that's the way I prefer to look at things. So yeah, in 2014, in August, we got rocked with a 6.0 earthquake. Um, and it came right through this place. Uh, and, and I guess if there's any good thing about that is that um, you know, this was the old Christian Brothers winery before we took it over and before it was Christian Brothers, it was, you know, somebody else's winery and somebody else's winery. So it predates uh, the turn of the century on the original bones of this place. And that's where we're sitting right now as part of the original bones uh, modified over the years. But nevertheless, this was started way back in the 1880s uh, sometime. The Christian Brothers had some really sexy names for the cellars. They were called Cellar One, Two, Three, Four, and Five. So creative. So this was Cellar One, um, and this was like the oldest part of the um, the winery. Um, the tanks down here predated uh, refrigeration. Um, they were outdated for what we needed. This was a ten thousand gallon tank that you're looking at that smushed. Um, you know, we we didn't really need that. You can see the tanks around it. That tank's uh, right off to the uh, left of it. That's a tank that holds one to three tons of grapes. So that's quite a bit less than 10,000 gallons. So um, when, when the earthquake came through, it, it did two things here at this location. It, it wrecked um, the room. I had about, uh, I don't know, I had about, shoot, I had about 20 or 25 tanks in this room. And they didn't all look like that, but this tank right here, what happened to it is it, uh, its bottom door got breached. So you can see the doors on these smaller tanks, that door on the bottom warped and the wine started coming out at such a fast rate that it sucked a vacuum in the tank and it, and it sucked it. And so we not only lost the 10,000 gallons that you see here, we lost uh, uh, 42,000 gallons out of the cellar um, that night. And it went crashing out the door and down the driveway um, and all throughout our courtyard, the, the decomposed granite and all the plants were stained red because it was Cabernet. Um, so anyways, long story short is 
this thing got destroyed in August and it did take us a while to rebuild it, but we rebuilt it too is a high-end state-of-the-art red wine making facility. So all of these little tanks, um, uh, the top, the, the lids removed so we can dump grapes right over the top so there's no pumping. Um, these tanks pump over themselves uh, on an automated program I can control from my phone. And uh, we went into something called, oh, there it is, oh. optical sorting. Um, and, and what optical sorting does is it just gives you the absolute perfect grape that, that you're going after in the vineyard. But because, you know, it's an agricultural product, you know, sometimes you get some raisining on a cluster. Sometimes you get a cluster that is lagged a little bit behind. It doesn't taste quite as ripe as the others. Uh, once we get the grapes off of the rachis, off of the stem, um, they drop down on this blue belt and it goes into the optical sorter. And with a computer program, we can target any kind of defect that we don't want to see come out the other end. And so what comes out the other end looks like, you know, blueberries or caviar or take your pick on what you think that looks like. But it's nearly a perfect um, grape. And what you can tell in the winemaking is like, is that a huge difference? It's not huge, but what we're after in Napa Valley is just getting a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. And what you can tell on the wines that have gone through this process is texture um, is really improved and overall fruit expression is really improved. So, yeah. Yeah, and so it's, it's a really cool, I mean, it really is a cool piece of technology that we've embraced with Lion's Head Wines, and it's given the opportunity to kind of try out some of this new technology. Uh, we don't shy away from it. And um, it's also part of the story too of sort of overcoming all of these challenges. And that's really what the theme around the Lion's Head collection is, is, you know, Mother Nature has thrown us, I don't know how many curveballs over the years. It's just crazy. We've got earthquakes, mudslides, um, fires of course and and droughts and anything you can think of and, and now a pandemic um but really you know we we take this challenge and um and we made these wines in celebration of that and so that tank that sits there right now is really an homage to mother nature that reminds us every day to respect that um and jessica is asking dave um what happens with all of the grapes that don't get make it into the perfection bin. Oh, Jessica, very, very attentive. All right. <laughs> um, those actually get tossed. Um, they get tossed with the mog material other than grapes, right? So the mog is leaves and stems and things. So unfortunately, um, they, they go to the reject bin. Mm -hmm. Why did I have this Willy Wonka reference popping through my head? I'm not going to go there. I don't know. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, and then Tracy's asking about the name of Lion's Head. So that's a great question too. Um, so Lion's Head actually is the name of, well, a couple things. So if you notice, there's a lion on every bottle of wine that we make. Uh, the Hess collection, it's part of the family crest and that's the history of the Hess logo. Um, that lion is actually on Donald Hess's estate in his home in Switzerland where he lives now. Um, and so the lion that's on our Hess wines is really an adaptation of that multi-generation of family. Um, and then to that, it's also representative in our lion's head wine. So it's a tie back to the, uh, the heritage, but also lion's head is a mountain in South Africa, which is actually where Tim, so Tim and Sabrina, we, we were showing that um, photo of the whole family before. In fact, I think we've got uh, another picture of them coming up here. But Tim, um, he grew up in Swaziland and uh, he spent his whole childhood in South Africa. And so Lion's Head is a mountain that's near and dear to his heart. He loves hiking there. And so it was just kind of the perfect name for the seller and for this collection of wines. So this is Tim and Sabrina. This is the next generation Hess family with their uh, two children. And they're the ones that are really um, running the show now. And it's, it's been amazing to see. Yeah, I, I didn't mention that we were on our second generation in the Hess family. So there they are, Tim and Sabrina. Um, they came into play around 2012, wasn't it, Christina? I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like that. And uh, what, it's been great because um, for those of us that have been here for a while, it was having a um, new energy, you know, and a, like a new breath of air to come in and 
um, they, they definitely took their time in listening and watching and learning. And then um, once they were ready, it was like, hey, here's what we'd like to do. And that's where Lion's Head um, wines came from, um, including um, this Lion Tamer blend, but also uh, a, a new Chardonnay and Pinot Noir line called Panthera, which come from Russian River, which is kind of different thinking, right? Because we're from Napa Valley, but um, it's more about chasing the grapes where they grow best. Mm -hmm. So, and look, it's already dark here in California. Christina, where are you? Are you you're in Maui or somewhere? I don't know where you are. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to talk about Lion Tamer Red Blend. And Dave, where where did this particular wine get its name? Let's talk about that first, because I think that's important to mention before we get into the ins and outs of the wine itself and the blend itself. Yeah, so uh, back in, uh, oh my gosh, like 2015, um, you know, Red Blends were a big buzz, which, you know, quite frankly, as a winemaker always made me laugh because uh, most wines made on the planet are blends, uh, at least red, but um, we, we termed this category red blends. Okay, so um, we're thinking, well, what can we do? What can we blend? And um, I immediately thought about Malbec. And, you know, I, I have been a big proponent of Malbec um, to blend in with my Cabernets. And I started that back in the early 2000s when I first got here and I looked at the vineyards uh, we had some Merlot, we had some Petit Verdot as blending. We had a small block of Cabernet Franc, which are all great grapes, but you really need to choose the grapes that work the best on your site. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, Cabernet Franc was not it um, on Mount Vitor. It's just a little bit too cool. Um, Merlot uh, was a, a good choice on paper, but uh, the reality on a lot of blocks were not um, hitting the kind of wines I wanted to make. Petit Verdot does work. Um, you have to really be um, choosy about the site. And so I started with Malbec and I planted three acres uh, back in 99 and we got a first crop and um, boy, I tell you what, it was stunning, you know, and, and that can happen. And so we decided, well, let's give it another year, but we'll also um, graft in another area because we can get the grapes um, into the bottle a lot quicker. We can get a result a lot faster than planting. And so I started to um, not only choose, choose areas I thought it would work, I started to choose areas that I thought wouldn't work at all <laughs> because I wanted to test it. And uh, boy, if the wine didn't hit a home run, it hit a double or a triple off every site. And so we gradually started to build our Malbec um, acreage up to where current day we're the biggest Malbec grower in Napa Valley. Now, that, it wasn't really like, that wasn't our goal. Um, it's just that we kept finding more and more of a need for this um, great grape. The reason that I love it so much is that, um, you know, it puts off a really inky wine, but so does the Cabernet, but mm -hmm. it has a different character on the palate than Cab does. Cab is, especially in the mountain vineyards, it's, it's got structure, it's got tannins. And the Malbec has this beautiful, rich, soft, round palate um, that when you blend in with Cabernet, just smooths out those tannins. Um, it means that you can naturally kind of soften the wine um, and it really rounds out the Cabernet quite well. But guess what? On its own, it's a stunner as well. Fruit forward, blue and black fruit, um, great concentration, um, and a lot of um, just richness and suppleness and roundness. So when we, um, when we went to base the, you know, come up with a, a, a grape for the, for the blend, it, Malbec seemed like a no brainer. And then you got to come up with a name which is probably even harder than making the wine. So, um, uh, you know, I, I yammered on and on about Malbec to somebody and, and she listened and she uh, decided, she's like, listen, what if, what if we called it Lime Tamer? And I go, well, what's, what's that? She goes, well, you keep telling me that Malbec tames the tannins of Cabernet. Why don't we make a red blend called Lime Tamer and we'll base it on Malbec. And so that's what we did. And that's Lion Tamer was born. And it plays an important role in the Cabernet as well. Um, but I wanted to share some of the footage of our vineyards because Malbec really does thrive in the highest elevation and just to kind of get a sense of how steep and and how actually elevated these vineyards are. Um, it's pretty impressive, especially when it comes to, you know, we were just looking at, at this photo here um, and and also 
bringing it back to the beginning when we were complaining about how cool it is. It wasn't as cold today as it was this particular day. This is a very rare day on Mount Meter when we actually got snow on the peaks, but that just shows you how high these vineyards are for Napa. You remember this, Dave? Yep, yeah, yeah, that's only happened a couple times in, in my tenure here, but um, it can happen. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about this blend and some of the flavors that you get from it. Um, okay, well, uh, let's see, I've, I've got the, what do I have, the 18 um, is in my glass, but you know, we've been making this wine, I think uh, 16 was our first vintage. Uh, well, wait, maybe it's 14. <laughs> I can't remember to be honest with you. Um, but the blend has always been more or less the same. So it, it's been between 60% and high 40% Malbec. So it's Malbec dominant. Um, just to remind everybody um, in, in this country, um, California for sure, you need to be 75% of a varietal to call yourself that varietal. So if I'm making a Cabernet, it has to be at least 75% Cabernet to maintain the Cabernet um, name on it. Other Otherwise, you go into a yeah proprietary red blend. So, um, glad yeah. you brought that up because Greg was just asking about why we call it a blend rather than a Malbec or you know with the Cabernet, even though there is Malbec in there, it's classified as a Cabernet. So yeah, yeah, and and that's another reason why we kept planning more because honestly, I didn't have enough to blend in with the Cabernet at the percentage I wanted to blend that in, plus make this red blend, but. So you, let's just call it, it's gonna be around 50% Malbec and most vintages. The next, um, there's three big components of this wine. It's Malbec, Zinfandel, and Petit Syrah. So the Zin is gonna be usually 20 to 30% of the blend. And uh, that's gonna really boost up the, the aromatic of the wine because that, you know, Zinfandel can have that really floral kind of component to it sometimes, uh, along with some really great fruit, of course. And then the Petit Syrah is also kind of an anchor you know, call it a little more backbone, but the Petit Syrah that we're um, growing and buying is um, all about like that big, rich boysenberry um, type of Petit. And if you get it nice and ripe, you're going to have some tannin, but they're not going to be over the top. It won't be distracting. And so those are the big, big three of the blend. And then every year we'll weave a little bit of Cabernet, typically some Petit Verdot, sometimes some weird stuff like Morvedra or Carignan. Um, or whatever. And, and none of it's just because, well, that's what we had. And it's not a kitchen sink um, aspect at all. It's more about um, once we've got the chassis, you know, how can we add on a little bit uh, of it, something extra special to make that, that either the aroma or the concentration uh, mm -hmm. splash a little bit. And that's kind of how we wind up. But I can tell you this from the first time we blended it, I've got this uh, idea in my head about what I want the wine to taste like, right? And the, the best way I can um, uh, throw an analogy out there is whatever you guys are making for dinner right now or what I'll be making later. Um, you know, a lot of times, I don't think any of us really follow recipes much anymore. I mean, you just go out and wing it, right? You have this idea about what you want to do with, you know, the marinade or the whatever it is you're doing. And so that's what I had in my head was I wanted to make this really big, rich, uh, bold style of, of blend and Malbec and Zin and Petit Syrah is a great way to help me get there. So hopefully yeah. you guys have tried this. You can tell me how I did. Delicious. I love this wine. I think the, the scores also show. All right. Well, I want to talk about Cabernet too, because um, Malbec is also part of this story. As I was saying, it is it's our tannin tamer here as well. Um, the blend is definitely different. Um, cab dominant but let's talk about that where are these grapes sourced from and um what's your what was your vision behind this one dave <laughs> well i mean you hit it out on it earlier it's like the alomi um the alomi cab for us has been a really um, successful program and that's really gratifying to see um but it's it's um flavor profile is drinkability and it's it's a little bit softer and so with the lion tamer we wanted to kind of take that that theme but kind of you know turn up the volume a little bit. So uh, uh, the source of this wine is, um, it's Pope Valley, um, Iron Corral, and we also um, have a couple of contracted Napa Valley vineyards. So right in the valley proper. Um, and this is an all French oak aged Cabernet. 
um, its drinkability is going to come from, you know, the fact that it does have some Malbec blended in to soften down the tannins, but you're going to, you know, you're going to feel a little bit more tannin than this one, perhaps, than you do the Alomi. Um, and it's, you know, it's more, I guess, traditionally made than the Alomi is because of the French oak and because mostly Bordeaux um, varietals being used. Sometimes we'll slide in some petite Syrah there just to just because we couldn't help ourselves. And, you know, it really truly makes a better wine. We're going to do it. Yeah. How would you say, what are like the major flavor profile differences between the Alomi, which we tasted earlier, and then this um, Lion Tamer Cabernet? Well, again, I, I think the, the tannin level on the Tamer has been turned up. So possible ageability will be turned up on this one. Mm -hmm. I get um, a lot of the um, secondary sort of aromas with the uh, oak and toast and mocha and chocolate on this wine. And I think on the Alomi, we're, we're experiencing more of like, you know, red fruit and plum and um, maybe some oak in the background. And so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think the Lime Tamer, you know, turns it up a few notches on the serious side. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the Alomi is, is a great wine to have, you know, every day or take that one to a dinner party and put it on the table. When you know the second you come back to it, it's gonna be gone. A line tamer, maybe you're going to want to save for your own table when you're having dinner. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. What are you making for dinner that you're going to pair with the rest of this bottle of wine? Okay, so I uh, barbecued a leg of lamb yesterday, and it's going to be left overnight tonight, but it was awesome with a Dijon sort of a uh, white wine Dijon um, marinade thing that I did. It was really, really yummy. Mm -hmm. That's how to watch football, right? Uh, Eve is having salmon later. So what would you recommend, Dave, of these four wines that we tasted? What do you think would pair best with salmon? You know, that's a no brainer. It's got to be the Pinot uh, for sure. Um, I think the Pinot would go great with the salmon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I have a couple more questions, but I want to make sure that we save some time too for our trivia questions, right, Shannon? Um, and if I missed any questions, please throw them out there. I know you guys have been doing such a good job monitoring everything. Let's see. Um, Dave, can you just really quickly, I've had a couple, this come up a couple times, um, where we source our grapes from, because we've talked about our estate vineyards, but do you also purchase grapes as well? Yeah, so um, yeah, we have uh, three vineyards on Mount Veter, and like I mentioned, there's three vineyards down in Napa Valley floor. We have a Chardonnay vineyard. We have the two Cabernet vineyards up in Pope Valley. Um, but I do also contract purchase uh, some tonnage around Napa Valley. Um, different, you know, from a, a, wherever the best vineyards are. So if it's a, a private person that has a really great vineyard, that's great. We also work with the Beckstoffer group and get some of those um, grapes out of George III and uh, Missouri Hopper vineyards, which uh, you'll see on, on labels around. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of a dabbling, but in Napa Valley, that's what we're doing. Um, if you've enjoyed our select wines, um, those come up from outside of Napa Valley. Those are more of a contract purchase play, but they're coming out of, you know, from Cabernet and Sauvignon Blanc, you're talking about Mendocino and Lake County, and we'll contract buy up there quite a bit. Um, we've been doing that for as long as I've been here and longer. Uh, we concentrated more on that. And so we literally get, I think, the top 10% of quality up there because we've been up there so long. Okay. Okay, Dave, I think that Laurel might be uh, about to stump you here. Great. What is your favorite wine of the four that we tasted tonight? Ooh, that's a good call. Um, okay. Uh, for me, you know, because you can tell that I, I really like Pinot, so that would be an easy, easy one. But honestly, I haven't had this um, Lime Tamer Red Blend since we bottled it. Um, and so when I was tasting it with y'all, Tonight, I was just struck how, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with the result. Really rich, round, ripe fruit. Um, that one might be going home with some lamb, but maybe the Pinot too. Okay, well, Shannon, I'm going to throw it over to you if you have any uh, other questions that I missed or yes. should we do some trivia? Absolutely. So let me just talk a little bit about the 90 Days Around the World program. Um, and then we will get into the trivia questions and close out with that um, on the high note there. 
So for those of you that are joining us, I'm sure um, most of you are already aware um, that tonight's event, as our every event, um, is part of our 90 Days Around the World promotion. And so we are offering all of our viewers the chance to win some really great prizes, including a gift card um, capping at $2,500 to the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets. Um, so great, great opportunity entering for a chance to win is super simple. Um, just head to your app store on your phone and download the Scabify app. Um, so you're going to earn points for every event that you join with us by entering a code word. I saw a couple comments in, in the uh, comment chat here on Zoom asking what tonight's code word is. So for tonight, we are going with lion's head. So more points you earn, the bigger the prizes that you'll be entered to win. So it's a really great opportunity um, to win some gift cards and um, go ahead and purchase some wines from the Hess Collection. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and tackle some of these trivia questions. Again, tonight's giveaway, we've got two $25 gift cards to liquor wine and wine outlets. And then we also have that awesome swag um, prize pack from directly from the winery itself. So let's start with the prize pack because I think that's one of the cooler gifts. Um, so the question for that, everyone get your typing fingers ready. Um, the, the first one for that is our Lion Tamer wine series was started in 2015 by producing a red blend. What grape variety is the, lend, is the blend based off of? Woo, all right, so we've got quite a few people. So let's see. Um, looks like David uh, Bashaw, you are correct. The um, grape variety that it's actually based off of is the Malbec. Uh, we talked about how awesome it grows there in the mountains and that was in fact the answer. So next question, let's get, get, uh, give away those $25 gift cards. The next question is going to be, what caused the reconstruction of Lion's Head Cellar? I'm looking for the year as well. Wow. Look at everybody. All what, right. Paying attention, taking notes. Steve, who was the one that commented about the, the, the ruined um, tank behind you, he was the first uh, one to respond on that. So he was taking good notes then. Nice job, Steve. Congratulations, Steve. All right, our last question for that second $25 gift card um, is going to be, what was the first vintage of Olomi Pinot Noir? All right, looks like David Kenny. Uh, yep, David Kenny, 2018 was the year uh, for that Pinot Noir, or the first vintage. All right, so I did see another question coming in. Let me just make sure. Um, kind of, kind of gets lost up in the uh, in the responses. Let's see. No, you know what? It looks like we may have captured them all. Um, well, yeah, and so you know what, Dave, I'll I'll kind of be the one that really stumps you on this. Um, I know we talked about what your favorite wine was. But what would you say is your favorite part about what you do, your job as the chief winemaker? Well, you know, the, the thing that got me in this business when I was a lot younger um, was sort of the notion that it would be like chasing the Holy Grail, right? You know, like you, you never know everything in, the, in my side of the business. Um, and it's a learning experience as you go. Um, and I like that. And I think a lot of people would get frustrated but I like pitting um, sort of what I've learned over all these years with the variables that get thrown at you. Now, I never really thought about, you know, wildfires and these types of things or earthquakes, but, but just what mother nature throws at you and how to respond and work with her and get the best out of you, that you can out of each minute. That's what I find really, really interesting and refreshing every year. And I think you guys have proved that you can handle the weather conditions and uh, you know everything that mother nature can throw at you. Um, I do think it's kind of like a medal of honor having that crushed tank there. Um, it's, it, you know, it's 
horrible that it happened, but you know, if that's left as a, you know, sign of your resilience, then that's awesome. Yeah. And love to show it off too. So, <laughs> you know, once, once we can all travel again, we would love to welcome you all to the winery. Come see it yourself. Dave's sitting actually in one of our tasting rooms where we host um, some fantastic lion's head experiences. We've got all kinds of creative uh, wine pairings that we can do. And then you get to see that tank for yourself. It's a serious Instagram moment right there. <laughs> the funniest thing I was going to add is that um, it was Tim, you know, our owner, it was insisting that we keep this tank, you know, because it was, it's so hideous, it's cool, you know, and so when we were reconstructing the room and the contractors, um, it took quite uh, an effort to try to figure out how to do this, you know, because we didn't want to cut it open and then have to like stitch it back together, that wouldn't look good, so we wanted, you can't really tell, but it's, we shish kebobbed it on a support column. Um, so once they had all the supports in, we, um, we built a sub temporary support to support the, the ceiling. We removed the column, took it out of the driveway, shish kebab the tank and brought it in and put it back up. So it was, it was quite a thing. But it, yeah, Tim's, you know, he, he can be a little bit nuts sometimes. And this, this is a good example right here. Well, it carries a very cool story, if nothing else. All right. Well, I want to thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. This has been such a great presentation. I'm seeing the comments flooding in about how awesome and how much everyone has learned. Um, thank you so much, Shannon, Chad, yes, Colin, amazing. and to all of you who joined us. We really appreciate you all. Um, this is keeping us going while we can't come out and see you in person. We absolutely love being able to do these tastings with you guys. So thank you. Fingers crossed that we'll see you in person behind the table next year at the Winter Wine Spectacular. Yes. We'll be there. We'll be there. Awesome. All right. So for those of you that are still watching, please be sure to pre-register on our 90daysaroundtheworld.com website for future events. Our 90 Days Around the World promotion ends this week. So we've got a, quite a few great events um, coming up in the last you know, few days of the week. Uh, tomorrow night, we're actually joined by the winemaker Charles Smith um, to get a night uh, for a tour, excuse me, of Washington wines. Um, so that will be a really great presentation. Again, tonight's code word for those of you that are playing with our Passport app is Lion's Head. All right. Thank you again. Have a great night, everyone. Hope to see you all tomorrow night. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.